uh, um, the topic is one one of the very favorite topics. I I always enjoy talking about ECG, and rather my very journey of uh, cardiology started with uh, I attended a lecture of ECG probably in 2016 um, by one of my mentors, Dr. Sangeeta Ma'am, and since then um, it has been an, an I know. A wonderful journey. So, are you able to see the presentation, uh, Dr. Usha? Yes, ma'am. Is it visible? Okay. So, the topic goes as a small animal electrocardiography, that is ECG. Okay. Electro is about the electrical conduction system. Cardio is heart, and to graph is to present it in a graphical mode uh, through using a galvanometer. Okay. So, what are we going to basically talk about is what the myths are about it and what are the established legends which are available, and especially we'll try to overcome the fear of how to read an ECG, how to report an ECG, because this is one of the most uh, affordable. You get an instant result with an ECG, and trust me, this could be, um, the people who are already practicing cardiology, I must say that you must encourage all your colleagues to study about it, your juniors to study about it, so that you know you can develop a very beautiful referral system and more than any other thing many of the cardiac problems can be identified even some non cardiac ones can also be identified using a simple simple device which could just cost approximately 20 or 25000 bucks so let's start so why keep telling this thing to people a lot why do we study cardiology you know cardiac but cardiology is not a very old subject um, maybe not even like two or three decades old um, in in the practice i mean so though cardiology has started with the animals but uh, it was all for human benefits right so i say every single patient who's walking into your clinic is definitely cardio compromised to some stage or the other but 10% of your patients who are walking every single day, trust me, 10% of your patients are showing some or the other clinical signs that you have to, you should have an eye, you should have knowledge to identify it, okay? So just imagine how much of the suffering are we ignoring, right? And anything that's an older patients I call more than like, you know, more than six years old, yeah, go for it. It is definitely compromised. And whatever the patients that you've identified as a cardiac patients, 75% of them are definitely showing the mitral valve degeneration. Whether it's a DCM case, whether it's a large dog, small dog, irrespective of any dog, you will definitely see there's a degeneration of mitral valve that's going around. Very few congenital heart defects uh, we come across. Mostly we see atrial septal defects, which is very, very common. I have seen some tricuspid dysplasia, mitral dysplasias. I have seen uh, uh, an Epstein anomaly. Uh, recently, we have seen another uh, beautiful mitral dysplasia in uh, mitral valve dysplasia in a cat. So yes, you, you do come across uh, these diseases, uh, congenital heart diseases, but their incidence is very low, or maybe we are not adept enough, or we are not trained enough to look into that aspect, right? It's a long journey, but yeah, we are going there, no problem. And uh, we know, we all know that there's a lot of breed predilection, right? So there's a lot of uh, very well-known breeds. For example, whenever a boxer walks into my clinic or a Doberman who's two or three year old, you know, or a pug and, or a golden retriever, I always tell the pet parents, you know, three years, two and a half years or three years is the cutoff. Go ahead and get the cardiac evaluation done. You should have a ground zero information from where you're starting because most of these is Kevilia King Charles Spaniels. By one and a half, two years itself, they start showing mitral valve degeneration because these breeds are prone to it. Okay, so when you have those breeds come to your clinic, make sure in your very first pet parent counseling, you tell them that, you know, when you write down all the deworming, vaccination, yes, schedule, was schedule, you have to also write down at the second year when they come down to you. For, um, uh, you know, uh, for, for the vaccination, you should write down. When you come down to the second year, you should ask a veterinarian this, this, this. Third year, this, this, this. So like that, if a toy breed comes in, you know, you have to tell them, fine. By five and a half, six years, you should ask me to look at the kidneys. You should ask me to do a preliminary cardiac evaluation because by seven years, they start showing clinical signs. If a pug comes in, by three years, you should start estimating the thyroid evaluation. You should start doing it, cholesterol and thyroid, especially if they're home food eaters. Golden retrievers, the same. Labradors, the same. You have to estimate them by three, three and a half or four years. If it's an obese Labrador, by fourth year itself, I start doing a cardiac evaluation. So these things, 
along with the along with the thyroid estimation so these things are something that you know you have to uh, i'm telling you all this basically to emphasize that there's so much uh, uh, incidence of this uh, um, you know cardiac compromised patients right next to you they are they coming into your clinic every single day all you need to do is know about it so that you can identify them right and um, okay so here we comes so dr ranjita is very well known for asking her questions hey kinney dr vishal sir so i might keep bugging dr vishal about it um i i am i audible to you all ma'am yes ma'am okay. you are audible thank you thank you thank you doctor so now can anyone answer this question who is the father of veterinary cardiology no googling please okay not not cardiovascular that is it absolutely who is a father of veterinary cardiology chalo let me tell you one he is dr david datweiler dr david has the credit of introducing the cardiology into veterinary medicine and rather he is the only veterinarian rather the first veterinarian who has got an opportunity to write down the chapter about veterinary cardiology in the human encyclopedia okay he you know a very very strong believer in and rather he has laid down the guidelines and was a strong believer of the you know, the physical examination especially auscultation he has put a five point uh evaluation for the cardiac patient so they can identify it. so you know it was it was in the early 19th itself early 19 19th century itself okay five minute screening protocol like you know you do the auscultation palpitation of the chest you know looking at the femoral pulses and also doing a single lead ecg especially the lead two so these are the you know the legendary people who has um, uh, introduced uh, us to the very concept of uh, veterinary cardiology right and uh, in 1982 i think he was uh, uh, there was there's a prize in his name by doc, dr dr twiler's prize that's been announced by vasawa so now we know who is the father of veterinary cardiology and i hope you guys remember from now on okay yeah. yes now what are these anyone early stage stethoscopes fantastic dr vishal yes they are the stethoscopes so i would say people who are whoever are here right now are definitely interested in cardiology to some or the other extent right so yes. please use all your senses available you know doing um, looking at a patient the moment he walks into the clinic looking they have a wide stance they have a deep respiratory you know effort they make the or they are open mouth breathers right or uh, sometimes they just they have a wide stance a sciatic patient are very evident so you know you can the moment you look at them just the physical examination itself you can uh, rule out uh, whether it can be a cardiac compromise whether you need to look into the heart or not similarly auscultation just hearing the sounds of the heart it itself is a big big topic and uh, a wonderful subject to learn so and it's definitely my favorite so once you start reading about cardiology you just cannot live without your step and we all know which way the stethoscope goes inside right you have to know the orientation of the earbuds so i normally when i do it i put my steth on i compress it i press it down find place or you know my my uh, this is where i'm giving my webinar is my lab where i do all my echocardiography and cardiac examinations so it's always a closed room it's a dark room it's closed room and i allow only pet parents and one or two of my assistants just to help so you have to maintain a calm environment and trust me heart speaks for itself it's going to tell you if it is sick or not trust me it's very much possible and once you start listening to the heart it's it's so musical it's so rhythmic start doing it doing it right now one of my mentors said i said sir how do you identify uh, murmurs he said start listening to the heart sounds 5000 patients and trust me you will know what the heart sounds are whether they are normal or not so start doing it guys for every single patient that walks into your clinic start auscultating them okay you should take minimum 30 seconds to auscultate on each side that is what is recommended by the time you are done with auscultation there should be the mark of your drum on to the chest wall okay 
Now, so our webinar today is all about trying to identify and burst what are the myths available regarding uh, the cardiac patients. The first thing is like, okay, whoever is coughing, is every coughing dog a cardiac patient or not? I heard the murmurs. I heard the murmurs. Okay, fine. Could be 100% a cardiac patient. Had compromised heart. I think I should start the treatment. Are you epilepsy or the syncope? All of a sudden, the dog fell down. Is he a cardiac patient? Now, I found some variations in the ECG. I took an ECG. It looks like different ECG. It doesn't look very normal to me. Am I supposed to start the heart medicine? Now, heart disease, we all know, is a progressive heart disease. Like everyone knows, like these days, that we have attended so many webinars and seminars and whatnot. Okay, we all know that it's a progressive heart disease. I have identified a type. You know, fine, he could be normal now, but it's anyhow going to increase, right? Chalo, let me start the treatment. I don't have to stage the disease, right? Or, okay, bad teeth. Mm, bad teeth means bad heart disease. So these are truly, I would say, um, not 100% correct things. Most of them are myths. Let's try to burst some of them or maybe all of them. Let's see how it, the things go, okay? Now, Let's get into the subject now. We all understand this, and I'll ask. I have shared these images with Dr. Vishal sir. I so please post them tonight once you're done with the webinars. So just a simple anatomy of the heart. We all know there are four different chambers: top two, bottom two. And remember, guys, heart is all about rules. All about rules. R U L E S. It's all about rules. So heart has two sides: the left and the right side. They're always separate. It has four chambers, top and the bottom chambers. They are always connected through a valve, right? Through a valve. Third important rule, only the bottom chambers, which are ventricles, are going to contract. The top ones do not contract. They are the reservoirs. So what do we call the top chambers? They are the atria. They're just the reservoirs. The blood comes into them, and then they just the blood flows down uh, into the ventricles, and then the ventricles uh, contract. So when the ventricles contract, the left side of the ventricle pumps the blood to the entire body, which is an oxygenated of the high nutrition blood. And the right side of the ventricle, right sided ventricle, it receives all the used blood. This simple anatomy we started in sixth class of our school itself, right? So we all understand these things. Left side valves are called as the mitral valves. The right side uh, um, heart valves are called as the tricuspid valves. We also know that the iota has a valve. We also know that the main pulmonary artery also has a valve. They're called as a semilunar valve, right? Now, let's look into how the heart works. Heart works by itself. It has its own brain to work. Your brain is not going to dictate every time how many times a heart should beat, when to stop or not. Brain is not going to dictate every time, okay? So when I'm, I'm talking now, you're listening to me, you know, Dr. Vishal is trying to coordinate everything but a heart is involuntary. It's just beating by itself, right? So there's an electrical impulses that are always generated and these electrical impulses, they are conducted, the they electrical energy is converted into the mechanical energy. That's when the contraction of the heart muscles happen. Okay? Electrical to chemical, chemical to mechanical, to be very honest. Okay. Now, the spot where this main current is generated, the main generator is called as a sinoatrial node, right? We all know this, right? So the sinoatrial node is present in the top right chamber, which is the right atrium. Now, these sinoatrial node, the signals that are generated from there, they are transferred to a subjunction. This subjunction is called as an atrioventricular node, which is in between the top and the bottom chambers. And there, this atrioventricular AV node, it works as a sieve, as a conduction system. It works as a sieve. Why? Because, see, pacemakers usually fire about 300 times a minute, but not all signals are transferred into mechanical energy. Why? Because this AV node, which is there, it sieves them. Only the number of times the heart is going to beat, only that many signals are going to go down. They're going to go down through these green fibers, whatever you, whatever you see, that is a bundle of his, bundle of his divides into the two branches, that is the left bundle and the right bundle. We all know what the Purkinje fibers are. Purkinje fibers are nothing but the end stage things, which enters, which innervates your myocardium, okay? Now, whatever the green 
lines that you're seeing doesn't mean it's a wiring system of the heart. They are just specialized myocardial cells. That's all. The only difference between the rest of the heart muscles and the and these green uh, green heart cells is that there is you know you have those uh, sodium potassium channels, right? So there are some sodium gated channels which are extra in some uh, um, some of these uh, green lines, and and the rest of the heart muscles have them less. It's like that, okay? Dr. Gary Walton, this is supposed to be um, one of the first person who has written a book on canine electrocardiography. Okay, so um, see, the publication was back in 1975. I have been trying a lot. I couldn't find this book, but if someone has a soft copy or so, I'll be more than obliged to have it. I would really love to read this book. So the, looks like uh, if you read the reviews, that's one of the best books written in veterinary cardiology. Uh, so the uh, can ele electrocardiography to be honest okay now what is so special about the heart muscles heart muscles have certain five unique properties and um, they are they they are they are the automaticity okay so it means that it can uh, maintain its pace the heart rate the number of times the heart beats per minute heart controls it by itself second it is how, uh, to what an extent it can beat, that is called excitability. Third is the electrical conduction of the heart, that's a dromotropic, the conduction itself, the speed of the conductivity, the heart can still maintain. Contractility, to what an extent the heart muscles can contract once the electricity is conducted. And also the heart has the capacity to relax by itself so that it can get prepared for the next beat, okay? Now, whatever these examples I have written down, like for example, in automaticity, I have written down tachybrady. It means that it increases the heart, has the capacity to increase or decrease the heart rate by itself. Threshold is like, you know, drugs, all these drugs which can do this job. For example, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine can do that. For improving the conductivity, uh, you can just uh, use a vagal tone or epinephrine can do it. For improving the contractility, you can then use calcium or any of those, uh, you know, beautiful phosphodiesterase uh, to inhibitors. You can use like pimobendin, and, um, and and refractoriness is all about relaxation. Do we really have the medicines for relaxation? Pimobendin is supposed to work through the vasodilatation to some extent, as has the leucotropic effect. But however, leucotropism is not supposed to be of a, a, a very high significance in the routine. Um, this thing, why? Because of the uh, the intense heart rate, the high heart rate our patients have, okay? So yeah, the Pimatone is on a, on a high list in our uh, cardiac shelf these days. Now, what exactly is an electrocardiography means? It is nothing but whatever the electrical signals that are generated in the heart, you know, they get converted into electrical energy, to chemical energy, chemical to it, gets converted into mechanical energy so that the muscles can contract and these changes, we are going to record it on a sheet, on a graph paper um, of, to using a galvanometer. So your ECG machine is nothing but a simple galvanometer, which runs on the basis of seconds, okay now? So this ECG is um, my, one of my most favorite modality. I really say that, you know, you can take it for granted that you do not need an electrocardiography machine or training to identify a cardiac patient. You do not need it. Okay. But ECG itself can be a great tool, can be a great tool because it is instant, it is an absolutely painless thing, you know, um, you can get the results instantly. There are certain patients, I, I will show you a couple of cases down there, where you can, you can give them the life back instantly, you know, you can know if the patient is alive or not, if it is comatose, if it is, if it is collapsing, okay, and whatever the information that you get is absolutely valuable. It means that it can help you take instant decisions on, okay, fine, if my patient is getting into a syncope, what, what are the things I should do so that I can revive my patient? Is, is the heart still beating or not? See, we all do, do this thing. We put a vital monitor in our uh, OT, right? So what does the vital monitor tell you? It tells about whether the heart is beating and how fast or how slow it is beating. Can you do the manipulation changes for ISO or shall you increase the oxygen rate? All these things information are just by your ECG. It's instant. 
absolutely affordable and most importantly can be done at any clinical setup and it's a non-invasive method. Now, what does an ECG do? ECG will tell you how fast the heart is beating and how rhythmically the heart is beating, right? Is there a difference between first beat and the second beat? How, whether there is a, a difference in the shape of the beat or the distance of the beat, okay? So it's about the electrical conductivity of the heart. Now, what are the situations in clinical setup where you can use ECG monitoring? A patient comes to me is like, ma'am, pehle khub chalta tha. He just gets exhausted. I literally have to pull him up after half of the distance. Then they come like, you know, Ali used to jump onto the table. Ma'am used to get onto the sofas and not. Now he gets exhausted. He doesn't want to. He used to go on to long walks with his dad, not going on anymore. When he sleeps in the nights, especially in the nights, he needs a pillow or else he starts coughing. Okay. I just saw certain episodes. He just falls off and says, you know, we're just walking. That's a syncope episode, right? So, you know, these are the complaints that come from the pet parents. These are the observations that come from the pet parents. But when you, as a veterinarian, when you do a physical examination on a dog, and if you feel, okay, whatever the sounds that you hear, like, okay, if that is not the same, if it is not equally spaced out, okay? then you can think about it. Okay, fine. Let's do an ECG and see. I, I think I heard long pauses. I think I heard a little louder and then you know, less loud sounds. Probably, it's, you know, I just need to do an ECG and see. Just to rule out if there is any kind of arrhythmia, okay? Next. I'll show you, I'll show you a beautiful case wherein a dog came to me, comatose, and um, I, you know, just looking at simple ECG, we were able to revive him back in six hours to life. I'll, I'll show you that case eventually, okay? And make ECG evaluations, you know, taking an ECG as a, a routine practice for any of your old dogs, any, or any toy breed dogs beyond seven years of age, uh, any hypothyroidic dog, any dog which shows the signs of uh, arthritis, or maybe possible hypothyroidism, please do it. Every pre-surgical analysis, you are going to do an ECG to make sure that the patient is not into uh, arrhythmias or it is not bradycardic or so. And it's such a beautiful modality, I'm, I'm telling you, you will enjoy it. See, we use xylazine every single day, right? We use atropine sulfate combination with xylazine. It, it's so common. We use ketamine. We use uh, glycopyrrolate. It's a day-to-day, every day. I've done two surgeries. I've done four surgeries. I've done four See, why don't you just take an ECG before and after? And you'll see what you're doing to the heart. Right? We are messing up. We are playing with it every single day. I have done my changes on the dosaging of my uh, drugs. I'm using injectable anesthesias. I do a lot of changes on them. I take a call and pre-oxygenating my patient if I am if I see the changes or if I see low heart rates or if I see I know okay my patient is not very obese fine but still it's showing low voltage QRS. Let me just go ahead and do another chest X-ray to make sure he's not having any fluids or anything inside the chest. So we give us lots and lots of information. So it's a fantastic modality. Take it up. Okay, so this guy, Candy, came to us. Um, so this kid was uh, going through uh, severe poisoning, hardly had any mentation. He came to me tachypnic like that. Okay, and uh, so you should have seen his severe tachycardia, you know, huge, and, uh, you know, putting him on fluids. This was just upon arrival. Huh? And, um, yeah, it was, it was a case of lead poisoning. So he really gave us, I don't have the, it's a very, very old case. So I don't have a recovery video of this, but it really was a fantastic case. It took about three or four days, but he recovered. He recovered very well. But then, you know, um, the confidence I had by just doing an ECG, getting, trying to get the, uh, the regular rhythm back, you know, increasing in the voltages, um, how the patient was recovering was giving me a lot of confidence that I'm on the right track of the treatment. Okay, now this the machine which I'm showing you on the left side is a simple BPL single channel machine, my most favorite. And uh, I, this is the one I have been using since 2016. It's been a fantastic machine, um, very, very affordable in terms of paper. And most beautiful thing I like about it, it's manual. 
I can take my strip one single lead as long as I want. Sometimes, you know, when the when I see when I see VPCs or if I see um, long sinus pauses, now I I put the turn on the machine and I leave it like that. I get long, long, long strips. Um, I think I have. This was one of my most recent patients, you know, this, this, this is how I take. I take long, long strips, I cut them out, you know. I'll, I'll show you this ECG when I do my next um, webinar, probably we'll, we'll talk about it. But yeah, it's, it's a fantastic machine and these are non-invasive uh, leads. Those clips are very easily available on Amazon. You can just you know, use it. We just need only four limb leads. You don't need chest leads. One chest lead is enough if you want to look at the chest leads. But ideally, it's not recommended. It's not needed. And uh, but make sure, always make sure. If you the rule of the system is that if you see there's something, the my rhythm, my ECG does not look normal to me. Make sure you go back and check the leads if you have put the leads correctly. You should always do that. Okay. And then only think about some arrhythmias or variations or whatever it is. It's a simple mistake we all do. So, yeah. So the top right, it's I'm just showing my trolley, the way I maintain my ECG machine. So it's a simple IKEA trolley. I just uh, move, that keeps moving around in my clinic everywhere. Okay. Now, this is the video I would like to play. We will post this video too, but we'd like to play about how am I, I, I take an ECG. So it's an old video and I hope it helps. Um, on all the four legs where you're planning to put down your probes. See, so there are different positions where you can put down your probes. You can use this area, you can use here, you can use here, you can use here, you can use here. There are multiple places where you can do it. Once you remove the fur, clean up the places properly so that you don't have the remnants of hair. You can do that only to certain dogs who are having a lot of fur. This also helps in the conduction as you just take out, uh, you are planning to wet the hair. I normally use some gel, like either you can use an PCG gel or even an ultrasound gel. Some people also use uh, uh, you know, the plain surgical spirit. It's okay to do this because they just help in improving your conduction. They help in reducing down the airspace between the electrode as well as the skin. Apply it thoroughly. Now place your probes. This is a single channel BPL machine I have here. I like using a single channel machine so that I can run the lead to for as long as I want. Use it only on the manual board. Okay. Now these are the leads. The leads over here, if you see, they just are very blunt. There's a non-invasive, it's very easy, it's absolutely painless. Now place your electrodes. notice here see even if the patient is in an emergency state he is so tachypneic he was an ascetic patient this guy uh, came to me in a very bad stage to be honest so we we did thoracosynthesis we did abdominal synthesis on him it's a dcm case just a two and a half year old labrador and uh, was an end stage dcm really really bad case 
Now, I always ask pet parents to assist me when I'm handling such pa pa patients, okay? Now, if you see the lady on my right, she's, I ask her to hold down the limb, the bottom limb. Always hold the bottom hand and the bottom leg. So the one uh, over towards the head, again, is the family member who's holding the hand and this lady is holding the leg. Try to calm down the patient as much as you can, make an ambient environment, make sure you always put some kind of clothing and all if it's an iron table or else even in, even on a, on your bucket table you can do it you don't have to put much on it so you know try to maintain a calm environment and um, you know you have to always involve the pet parents it really really helps in their acceptance uh, of you know what you're doing so <laughs> Uh, sometimes, you know, these guys, we all know pugs are the most scariest patients. So if I feel as he's my, you see, look at the ex extended neck, open mouth breathing, you see dilated pupils. So that it is a brachiocephalic dog. So he just didn't want to lie down. Fine. I'm okay with it. I was taking a standing ECG. And the, uh, the, the, the rodent or the rabbit over there, you see, is a little bunny, honestly. So he's already on oxygen and then, you know, totally recumbent, completely uh, dilated pupils. You can still do an ECG, but you have to have some kind of insulation down there. This cat was a simply, um, uh, I think this was a lymphoma cat, yeah. The cat, so that I did not use any cloth down there because we were doing, for the, both the bottom two pictures, we were doing it on our bucket table. So the bucket table on the top, it doesn't have any kind of iron, but it has a sheet which is non-conducting. Now, with the bottom right picture, if you see, that's my junior vet. At that time, he used to work for me, Dr. Uh, Rizwan. What is he doing? See, this dog was severely tachypneic, and there was so much of movement, breathing movement. Like, it gets really tough sometimes, you know, because to uh, know whether it is a, a breathing artifact or it's really an arrhythmia. So, what I do is I ask, I ask them to close the mouth for a few seconds and breathe over the nose. So while he's breathing, I record the ECG so that you have very few movement artifacts, okay? You can follow these things. Now, let's get a little deeper into the ECGs now, try to understand the, uh, the base, that is the myocardium. So the myocardium is a very, very specialized, cardia, uh, specialized uh, um, muscle cells, as we know. So... We said that there is an SA node. SA node has the tendency to spontaneously generate the elect electrical signals. And then we have an AV node, which works as a sieve, and then bundle, bundle of Purkinje fibers. And so this is nothing but the conduction myocardium. The myocardium, which is capable of conducting the electrical signals, carrying the electrical signals to the heart muscles. And next we have is a contractile myocardium. It means whatever the electrical energy or the signal that is passed on, it will be transferred onto this uh, rest of the heart muscles, which is pink in color. So these rest of the heart muscles, they take that electrical signal and then they start either contracting or relaxing as per based on whatever the signal is about, okay? <laughs> now, when I say about the legends, it means the information so far that's been available. Let's try to understand that first. So cardiac muscle is an absolutely specialized cell where this uh, absolutely specialized muscle a tissue where the cells are arranged one next to the other in a syncytium. They are connected with each other through the intercalated discs and or the gap junctions. They have gap junctions and they're connected with each other. It's like a syncytium. <laughs> now, um, uh, remember, Whenever we talk about a cell, and especially in terms of electrical conduction, remember that cell is nothing but a bag of potassium. Because most of us get potassium under hota hai normally a bahar hota hai. There's one thing that's one way of remembering is just imagine cell as a bag of potassium. Outside the cell, it's like you know, sodium is more, and inside potassium is more. That is normal. Or another way to remember is technically, see, whenever we are estimating the electrolytes or the potassium, you know, looking for uh, potassium levels, we, we collect the serum, right? So we're looking at the serum potassium levels. It means that it should be either high or low. That is your suspicion. It means that in natural condition, the potassium should be inside the cell. Okay. Now, so in a general cell, this, the light pink color, what you're seeing is the cell. It's just the rectangle is the cell. And outside is uh, where you have lots of sodium 
and calcium is also more on the outside. This is normal. This is normal for a cardiac muscle. Now, I took a lot of my effort. There are only five or seven slides wherein uh, it will talk about the most basics of uh, generating the impulse and uh, you know talking about the calculations and all they're just five or six slides guys please pay extreme attention because once we are done with this mostly we are done with the ecg lecture okay now this slide talks about what how a normal cell functions how a normal cardiac cell functions okay we said there is potassium more potassium inside right so if this red color thing is a cardiac muscle cell the next half red colored is also a next cell all the red arrows that you see the gaps in which these arrows are nothing but the gap junctions through which one cardiac muscle cell is connected to the other one okay this is normal right now like every single cell has got his innate energy right this has this innate potential so in 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 a regular cell there is always the uh, uh cross or the passing of what you call maintaining that electrical potential across the membrane so in normal scenario what happens for every two potassium ion that goes out three sodium ions go in that's how they maintain the say um, um electrical potential across this membrane right now once this uh crossing of these i mean once the passage of these ions takes place then if this it needs it reaches to like 9 minus 90 millivolts then that is normal that's called as a resting membrane potential all the cells have a certain resting membrane potential i mean i'm i'm talking about the myocardium i'm not talking about the conduct conduction cells here i'm not talking about your sinoatrial node or ev node i'm talking about the general cardiac muscle cells okay so they are supposed to have like minus 90 millivolts as your resting membrane potential but the cell is not doing anything now whenever you supply if you can see the big purple thing that are put at the top left corner is nothing but the stimulus any kind of stimulus for that matter anything you know it could be a signal through electrical you know a signal that's coming through your conduction system or it could be some chemical trigger anything whenever a myocardial cell receives that then the um, the passage of sodium potassium ions out and sodium ions inside it increases further thus leading to there is three sodium ions coming out for every two going out so there is an increase in the positive and positive electrical energy inside thereby from 90 to slowly it reaches to 70 millivolts so when it is minus 70 millivolts it is called as a threshold potential threshold free so reaching this threshold potential is absolutely a very very crucial process wherein at this threshold potential what you see this is there are other sodium channels there are sodium the huge sodium channels which get open onto the membrane of the cardiac muscle cells so now what will what will happen the moment they are triggered by the threshold potential there's so much of sodium influx happening though the potassium is going less outside but there's lot of sodium coming inside so inside you have a lot of positive charges right so slowly that electrical potential is going to reach up till zero now this when it reaches to the level zero it means there are no further uh, change from the negativity to positive so at that point of time you have big channels of calcium which are calcium pumps that we call they open up and this calcium pumps further opens uh, further increases the positive uh, charges inside the cell by because calcium again is a positive charge but during this time not only the calcium but also the gated potassium channels open now the potassium gets efflux so in this process it is a little slow process a time consuming process there is a long plateau this this wavy graph is a long plateau it's during that stage the cell stays as an excited stage right and after certain period of time this calcium channels they just close down and the potassium is continuously pumped out so now the more more it gets more and more more and more negative because lots of positive ions are going out it keeps moving out till again the cell reaches a 
resting membrane potential, okay? There's not much um, complication to this, guys. Don't worry about the names of the channels and everything. Just remember something that how a cell receives an electrical signal and converts that electrical signal into these chemical ions. And then from these chemical ions, these ions, it ages mostly the sodium ions. Again, they are, they move. As the sodium is more inside, so these sodium, again, through these gap junctions, they get into the next cell. And that's how the conduction of that electrical signal which is triggered, it moves from one cell to the another in the form of a succession in one direction. And that's the reason it's called as a sensation. That's why once the atria empties, valves open, atria empty, and then your ventricles, both the ventricles contract and they contract in a very beautiful fashion and they also relax in the same beautiful fashion, okay? So this is what happens. Because the cell loses its natural polarity of being negative by losing lots and lots of potassium and gaining sodium inside. So that's the reason it is called as depolarization because it is losing its natural potential. Now from the depolarization, once the cell gains back again its negative potential, it is called as gaining the potential back or it's called repolarization. So this gap between the depolarization and repolarization is nothing but your action potential. Excuse me. The action potential and this action potential is what is carrying your signal from one cell to the other. Okay, so. that whatever we were talking about right now was about the general myocardial cells, right? Now, what are the exceptions? Because um, when um, the conduction, the, the, the conduct, the, uh, electrical conduction is carried away, carried by the SA node, AV node, all those things, right? So this conducting myocardium, how different is that when you compare to the, when you compare to the, the rest of the myocardial membrane is that in SA node, you have something called as a sodium leaky channels. Because of having those sodium leaky channels, the SA node is always on a positive side. It, so here you don't see uh, the resting membrane potential. They always are slightly on a higher tone of threshold potential. That's the reason they're always active. They are continuously sending the signals. There is no stop to it. The SA node is continuously firing and they're firing approximately 300 times a minute. Okay, that's the reason it's called as an SA node. When you come to the AV, that is, the um, I told you it's, it's like a sieve, right? The junction, which is present at the junction of uh, uh, atria and the ventricles. So this AV node is, uh, it's comparatively, even to, uh, structurally also, it is supposed to be smaller area, but the beauty of the AV node is that, why does what makes it like a sieve is, here the cells are right next to the, each other. The myocardial cells are supposed to be longer and they're right next to each other. And um, they are, uh, uh, sorry, they're horizontal, I'm sorry. They're horizontal like, uh, like, a, 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 like, like, you know, plate, they are horizontal like that. And, but they are longer, okay? So to cross each layer, if the electrical signal, the trigger that is passing, which is generated by the ASA node, if it is not enough, it doesn't have enough of strength, then it will vanish off by crossing those number of layers. So if 300 times a minute of the SA node is firing, probably, you know, uh, in, in animals, we say uh, small breeds or toy breeds, even 120 and 140 normal. It means like almost half of the signals are vanishing by the time it crosses the AV node. And then in cats, 200 to 220 is normal. So that many signals are passing um, from, the, uh, from the AV node. It's like that, okay? Now, next is bundle of Hess and Purkinje fibers. These are again, very fast conducting cells. They are very uh, narrow and they're very fast conducting cells because they have lots of extra calcium. This extra calcium, they open slowly and they close slowly. It means that there's a huge uh, um, uh, um, 
passage of uh, calcium across and that helps in the faster conduction, right? And atria ventricles, we already talked about just now in the previous slide that they are just the myocardial cells and uh, the normal threshold protein, the normal resting membrane potential they have is uh, 90 millivolts, the ones which we were talking about in the previous slide, okay? Now, so if you see, if you look at the various parts of the heart, if these are two atria, in atria, the conduction speed is approximately 0.5 meters per second. In AV node, I said it goes really, really slow. It's 0 0.05 meters per second, one tenth of it. In bundle of his, it doubles four times, approximately two meters per second. In left and the right bundle branches is approximately, again, two meters per second. Okay, so this is the slowest is AV node. That's the reason it is called as a sleep, sieve, chania, sleep. Now, on the other hand, this the ventricular muscles, here we find 0.5 meters per second, same as the atria, atrial muscles, and in Purkinje fibers, they're very, very thin, and then multiple fibers which enter into the myocardium. Again, the speed is very high, that is four meters per second. And that's what makes the ventricles contract, okay? How many of us actually seen him, met him? Did any of you, uh, right now uh, uh, in the webinar has met Dr. Tillet? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So yes, if you meet him, you can never, never Amazing person, him. amazing person. Absolutely, that is a description. I haven't seen anybody like so much energetics about the study. Absolutely. After this age, he's so energetic. He is. He is wonderful. He has written tens and tens of books, probably written hundreds of chapters on ECG and general cardiology. His, you know, this book is, is for all the beginners, Bible, always have it, always have it. One of the best books that you can start your veterinary cardiology with, okay? And written numerous chapters in, uh, uh, in your, 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 all your um, elsewhere publications, you know, the Blackwell Five Minutes concept. Wonderful, wonderful guy, you know. Um, uh, to him, when you, he says that just by looking at the ECG strip, from a distance, you can say if it is in the rhythm or not in the rhythm. Just look at the tall R waves, that much is enough. Whether it is normal or no abnormal, 50% of your job is done right there. So, you know, the, if you ever get an opportunity to listen to his lecture, whether it's an online or offline, never, never miss it. These are the people who make your subject look so simple, so acceptable. And, uh, you know, you, you gain a lot of confidence. Uh, these, are, these are pioneers. They are legends, you know. Wonderful person. Yeah. Okay. Now we are getting into a little tougher part of the topic. Yeah. ECG strip, I'm Madam, Kadi kadi dikta. I said, it's all lines. What am I going to read in those lines? I was like that. I was where all these things have happened to me. Okay. But after attending my first ECG lecture and solving the problems in that ECG, uh, you know, reading those rhythm strips and all, in the very first lecture I did it. If I did it, did it you all can do it. Okay. In the very first lecture itself. And then I came back home. I pulled out my dad's old ECGs, really old ECGs, and uh, started reading them. Okay, yes, there is some difference, but yeah, you can very well do it. It's possible. So before actually getting into how to read an ECG, let's just look what are the standards that this ECG paper describes, okay? You have big bold lines, and then you have tiny small squares. The big square is holds 25 small squares. This is a standard paper, okay? Now, so, when the, when you, the way it is made is, it says that if an ECG machine runs and 300 big squares is equal to for one minute. So in one minute, how many be, number of beats you see is nothing but your heart rate, isn't it? Now those 300 big squares in one minute, it means in 60 seconds, you see 300 big squares. So in 30 seconds, in six seconds, you have about 30 big squares. So all our calculations are based on this. 30 big squares is equal to 60 seconds, okay? Or maybe one big square is equal to 0.2 seconds. Gentlemen, there has been a beautiful dialogue by one of our very renowned professors 
um in uh, i mean he's a great great speaker in anesthesiology and uh, ophthalmology dr suryadas sir from um, kerala when i attended to his first lecture he said do not remember the numbers and dosages take a print out put it on your wall there's so much more to remember for a doctor right so do that this this don't be ashamed if you don't remember these things it's absolutely fine go ahead click a picture paste this picture on your uh, uh, on your on your room or your table right next to where you do your all your calculations it's okay to do that okay there are certain uh, slides which i will definitely ask you to click a picture it means that have a print out till you get used to reading that you know allow your eye train your eye to start looking into an ecg paper from a distance first and then don't start looking it like this always start reading like this and then you can put it on your table and read it okay so okay before i move on whatever is the horizontal thing is about the time and the one which is on the y axis is about the voltage okay so how tall a wave goes it means that high the voltage it has whatever the tissue that you're recording that high voltage in that particular area okay now the horizontal line that is on the x axis it talks about the time it means how wide your wave form is it tells about how much time it is taking to repole depolarize and repolarize okay how much time it is taking for the electrical conduction from the generation from the starting to the end how much time it is taking talks about that okay so x axis is about time y axis is about voltage now the standard rule goes is there are five steps to interpret an ecg all this information has been given most of this information has been given by the, in, in the book by dr tille and uh, these are all standards these are the legends which has already been established okay i didn't make any of this myself i'm just imparting the education but they in a very very simple way they have been described and always follow the chronology first the moment you look at an ecg strip try to assess the rhythm try to calculate the heart rate and then try to calculate the mean electrical axis i'll tell you what the mean electrical axis is and then we'll do you know if we'll look at the each each waveform entire complex and we'll study okay find how does it look what is normal what is the variation from this uh, normalcy and is are, are all the waveforms do all of them they look alike are they spaced equally or not okay they look all good and equally spaced so fine what is the difference between the p wave of this uh, waveform and the p wave of this or what is the what is the relationship if i have certain shape of p wave with respect to the qrs complex all these things okay so these are very important steps have to be studied in chronology have to be repeated in chronology i will also post you a report of how the way we give an ecg report um, i have a small format here i will just tell you it is also a standard format i made some slight changes but it's a standard times the heart is beating in one single minute right so when you look at an ecg strip if i see all the waveforms in the normal uh, succession it means that okay fine between the two waveforms how many big squares are there i'll just take calculate you know count the number of big squares and divide uh, divide that number over 300 okay if the rhythm is not regular it means that pqrs complexes are not spaced equally then what you have to do is count 30 large squares and multiply it by 10 all this information whatever we are talking about is at 50 paper speed the two paper speeds i i was also talking about in in the video mentioning about the in the video that when you look at 25 mm per millivolt at that speed you get very fast waveforms so it will tell you okay fine whether it is in a big are there lot of big spaces in between the waveforms or not so that is you're talking about the rhythm but when you're looking at each pqrs complex in that fast speed you can't read 
So now you have to read it in a slower speed. That is, you do, you calculate like 50 at, at the speed 50, where you go for 50 meters, you know, in one minute. In, in that way, you can um, you can have more wide, spaced out, nice, good waveform, all uh, PQRS complex theory, clearly visible. Then you can study each waveform in that, okay? Now, coming to um, just an example of this, for example, if you see here, all the waveforms are equally spaced out, guys. These are not my ECGs. They have been just, you know, I, I stole them from internet for the ease of calculation, that's all. If you see this gap, the space between each PQRS complex is absolutely same. Okay, almost absolutely same. So when you do that, so it's called as a regular rhythm. It means it's the same and regular rhythm. So in regular rhythm, all you have to do is divide, calculate the number of big boxes between two regular rhythms and you know divide that number over 300, right? Now, if the rhythm is not regular, if the spacing, for example, you're just, you have two small, uh, uh, two big boxes, you have three big boxes, you have almost four year, almost four and a half year. Now what I do, what we do is we count 30 boxes. It means we are taking six seconds strip. Now this 30 big boxes, you count how many are, are there, how many tall waves are there, are, are and then um, multiplied by 10. At, this is about paper speed 50, okay? And that will give you your heart rate. Go ahead and paste this thing also. Just, just a quick uh, glance to uh, see the approximation. But this one, this, this uh, picture basically is meant uh, for a regular rhythm. You can't use this for an irregular rhythm, but I'm just telling you, if you have a regular rhythm and you quickly want to, I don't want to count anything, I just want to know. So you can use this to assess the approximate heart rate, okay? Second important step is about step is about evaluation of the rhythm. Okay, so as we say, P wave, there are four waves, right? P, Q, R, S, right? So if a P wave is present, it means that it is originating from a SA node. Okay? I actually, one second, I should have, a, uh, yeah. Let us probably, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the waveform first and then go about to the measurements. See. Then in, in an ECG waveform, waveform means it's an entire complex, okay? You have a P wave, the first small little bump, then a little segment, which is called as a PR interval. Then you have the first negative deflection, that is the first negative wave. Then comes the big positive wave, that is an R wave. And then the second negative deflection, which is called as an S wave. You have a straight line here which is usually not a straight line, but anyways, you have a segment here, it's just called as an ST segment, and then you have a T wave here. And uh, so this T wave can be positive, can be negative, can be biphasic. So in veterinary medicine, we say that the T wave significance is, the study of T wave significance is not very high, unlike in humans, where you see, um, you know, they you don't you have a lot of uh, stem eye, like, uh, ST segment elevation, and there are a lot of T wave variations that happen, especially in the coronary artery diseases. Fortunately or unfortunately, the, our patients don't have that, though there have been a couple of recent uh, uh, publications that say that boxers do go through that, bulldogs go through that. There was an English bulldog who has reported a coronary artery disease, but you might have some focal impacts, uh, focal uh, my myocardial impacts, but not like humans, okay? So when you look at the rhythm, if you look at the strip, if I see equally spaced out QRS complexes, then it means it's a regular rhythm, okay? Now, if you see that there is a big gaps, it means the rhythm is not regular, it is irregular. However, if the irregularity is same, for example, after three waves, we see a gap, after three waves, we see a gap. It means that it is regularly irregular. But if those gaps appear rampant here and there without any uh, regularity in there, then we call it as it is an irregularly irregular rhythm. Okay, or maybe it's, you can just call it as an irregular rhythm also. Right? Now, coming to the mean electrical axis. 
now what is mean electrical axis it is nothing but the overall net deflection the net current which is goes from the right atrium from from your right towards from your right arm towards your left leg okay where is the net deflection so that net deflection will tell you about how the ventricular depolarization is happening okay mean electrical axis in a routine people don't calculate it much but it's one of the fantastic uh, ones which can just be done in seconds there are many many methods of doing it but i'll tell you two simple methods ideally it is said that if a mean electrical axis falls in the range of 40 to 100 degrees then it is absolutely normal the gray cone that you see here this is the normal mean electrical axis but if i get after calculation if i get mean electrical axis which is way less than 40 if it is less than 40 then it is left ventricular hypertrophy and if it is way beyond 100 then it could be the right heart which is affected okay so fantastic indicator you don't even have to go for an echocardiography or you know things like that to understand it can give you right away now how do we estimate how do we calculate the mean electrical axis for doing that when you look at an ecg strip and you have to take all the leads here lead 1 lead 2 lead 3 as well as the accessory leads like you know avr avl avm all these leads are mentioned in your in your book uh, or sorry on or over your machine so you have to calculate all the leads take record all the leads in succession keep the strips like that and now you see whichever lead shows the highest net deflection whichever lead show the highest uh, r wave now that is the lead where your mean electrical axis is lying okay it means if the highest deflection is in the lead 2 your mea is in the lead 2 which is between that it is absolutely normal okay similarly there's another method of calculation is after you look at all the leads if there is if, if any of this lead shows waveforms which are you know positive negative they are almost equal that is called as an isoelectric lead for example if my lead 3 is isoelectric lead okay so if my lead 3 is isoelectric lead then the lead which is perpendicular in this hexaxial system okay if my the lead which is perpendicular to this uh, um uh, lead 3 is where your um what do you call uh, your mean electrical axis is like line okay and it's not very easy at this point of time to uh, to uh, understand or calculate by just looking into a webinar but please carry this information this is one of the most simplest way of doing things if you start reading your ecgs and start practicing a little bit how to calculate the mean electrical axis it just gets very easy and it's a very very informative thing okay now once you are done with checking at the high heart rate recording what kind of rhythm it is you know accessing what kind of rhythm it is then calculating the mean electrical axis the fourth uh, um, step is all about taking the measurements okay you must say like how many big squares or small squares is the p wave about what is the distance of pr interval how much is the qrs complex uh, um, uh, you know how wide is it how tall is it okay and when it comes to the st segment okay is that st segment uh, like isoelectric or is it elevated or it is uh, depressed or coving that information is very important in t wave how tall the t waves are or how wide the t waves are gives some very crucial information about the other systemic things that's going around or some electrical imba uh, electrical sorry um some ionic imbalances that are going around or even some hormonal changes also it will talk about and then you know the overall qt distance tells about the speed of the rhythm okay now five and the most crucial part the fifth step is all about making your report everything depends upon this but you cannot get to this step without knowing the information in the remaining four steps okay so okay i got a beautiful rhythm step 
fine. I have calculated the ease, uh, heart rate. I know what kind of rhythm it looks like, whether it's regular or irregular. I know this. I have calculated the mean electrical axis. My strip is right in front of me. Now, how do I study? How do I understand? And what does the strip tell me about the condition of my patient? If the P wave is present, it definitely means that my atria contracting. So if my P wave is uh, present, it means that all my waveforms are generated from SA node. So we call it as a sinus rhythm because it is generating from a sinoatrial node. Okay, But I don't see a P wave. Okay, there are QRS complexes. Is that possible? Yes, definitely it's possible because any single cell of your heart muscle is capable of generating the electricity. It's not just the conducting cells, okay? We told, there was a five points, we told that properties of the cardiac muscle is the conductivity, automaticity, they can generate the electrical conduction by themselves, okay? So any cell of the heart can produce, fine. It is not as fast as the pacemaker, but it can. So it is called as an ectopic beat, beat which is not generated from an SNO. Fine. Now, okay, you have seen the P wave, P wave, fine. The P wave is present. Yes, it is normal sinus rhythm. Whether the P wave is equally spaced, okay, good. So it's a regular sinus rhythm. But if the P wave is not regularly spaced out, there are a lot of gaps. It could be anything. It could be blocks. It could be junctional blocks. It could be AV block, or it could just be in a different kind of an ectopic beat. It could be anything. Okay. So that's how you have to assess the relationship between a P wave and a QRS complex, just looking at the ECG strip. So this is giving you so much of information right there about the heart that you're examining, right? Now, PR interval. PR interval, you know, it is um, uh, kind of uh, not very easy to assess until and unless you have an eye for it initially. But if you if you are if you are used to counting the number of boxes in a waveform and studying, then if you see that you know, I'll I'll share you the slide of the standards. And as for the standards, if the PR interval is shorter than the standard, then we say it is definitely an accessory pathway, which is not going through the regular AV bundle of his for Kinji, but it is going through some other, it's taking some other route to get into the ventricle, okay? But if the P wave is really prolonged, there's a big gap between the P wave and the Q wave. It means that it could be some kind of AV block that is, we call the AV block one, okay? So first degree AV block, that's what we call. But if the PR intervals are not same, it means you know, somewhere you see three small squares and the other one five or three or two, whatever, all different PR intervals, then you can say that probably it's, um, you know, some kind of vagal tone. Uh, it could just be an, an uh, AV dissociation, AV dissociation, ECG. It means that the atria and the ventricles are not contracting at the same point. Right? That's one thing. Now, so let's start looking at the QRS complexes. If the QRS complexes are nice, good, tall, and peaked, and wider, so if the R wave amplitude, the height of the R wave is really tall, what does it tell you about it? Taller than normal. Okay, it means that it is taking more current to go to contract and relax, or it is taking longer duration to contract and relax. So it means that Either it is a big heart or it is a thick heart, right? So it definitely mostly tells about the ventricle, ventricles, which are, you know, it could be enlarged because it takes a longer duration to, or it takes more current to uh, contract, okay? But in the shorter complexes, doesn't really talk about the size of the ventricle. It doesn't mean that it is a smaller ventricle. However, what you have to assess in those tiny, tiny complexes, what you need to understand is, your ECG machine, so heart is somewhere deep down there, right? And you're connect, connecting the leads onto the arms, right? Flanks and arms. So there is a time gap from the heart till the skin where you're calculating. So air is the most efficient conductor of this. However, apart from air, if there's something else, for example, it has, uh, uh, it has what you call hydrothorax, or if the patient is really obese, you know, a lot of blubber in there, or if there is pericardial effusion or pleural effusions or chylothorax, hemothorax, hydrothorax, everything mentioned up there, or even just like subcutaneous edema, then the signals which have been released by the heart are not able to reach to your galvanometer electrodes. 
okay your uh, your, your galvanometer is not able to catch them in that amplitude that's the reason it is the shorter complex ones okay <coughs> Now, let's look at, we know the PV waves, we know the QRS waves, what is the relationship between the P and QRS wave? Simple standard protocol is for every P wave, there should be a QRS complex, that is normal. If there is no P wave, it means that it is not a sinus rhythm, you know it right away. The waveform is generated from somewhere else, okay? For R, if there is a P wave present, multiple P waves, but there is no Q, so it means that the pacemaker is generating the conduct electricity. It is it is uh, uh, contracting the atria, but with, for every single uh, signal, whatever it's uh, uh, contracting, it is not going down. It could be a blockade at the AV node, right? And these blockades are much more serious. They could be second degree or third degree AV blocks, right? So that's the difference. That's how you interpret. That's how we ana analyze looking at an ECG. Okay. Now ST segment. ST segment, usually we all ignore a lot, but to me it's very, very important. It gives a lot of information, especially when my when, having, when I'm having a dysnic patient, patient who is, uh, you know, breathing very with a huge difficulty or not breathing um, or his tachypneic, then you can talk about oxygen content, like it could be myocardial hypoxia, transmural MIs, pericardial effusions. In all this, you'll see there is a slight elevation in the ST segment. You can see a depressing ST segment also means that the patient is low on the oxygen levels. Also, possibly there could be a lot of electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia or hypokalemia or the calcium variations, or it could be digoxin toxicity, or it could be magnesium variations. Okay, so ST segment depression has got a lot of uh, significance. See, just looking at a small little line, you have so many differentials, isn't it? Now, QT intervals, QT intervals are not of huge clinical significance um, in, in a clinical practice, but any rhythm, any, any waveform which is faster will have shorter QT segments, which is very slow will have longer QT segments. So you can just say whether it's a tachycardia or bradycardia, that's all. Okay, you can go ahead and uh, um, uh, take a picture of this and please paste it in your clinic. And I would definitely like to thank one of our vet guardians. I stole this slide from him. He worked on making this slide, Dr. Kiran Kumar, sir. So he delivered a fantastic lecture on uh, ECG, basics of ECG uh, during lockdown times. So yeah, it's, it's, these are all the standard values, okay? So you are going to assess your, rhythm, your ECG waveform based upon these vari any variations from these standards, okay? This is how an ECG report should look like. First, calculate the heart rate, assess the rhythm whether it's regular or not, take all these leads and calculate the mean electrical axis and see whether it falls in the range of 40 to 100 degrees or not. Okay, if it doesn't fall, whether it is less than 40 or more than 100, so which side of the heart is affected, you get an idea. And then at each single letter, that is each single uh, bit of the entire waveform you have to study. Look at the P waves, Look at the QRS complexes um, and, uh, you know, specifically look at Q waves, look at S waves, look at how tall the R waves are, what is the PR distance, what is ST segment elevation, the ST segments, whether elevated or depressed. See, all this information, we just talked about how clinically important these things are, right? And once you have counted all those numbers, once you have put all those numbers, and then you go ahead and establish a relationship between those P and QRS complexes, okay? We just talked, if a P wave is present or not with every QRS wave, you have to understand that it is an ectopic beat. Okay, whether the T wave, whether the T waves are taller or wider, or if the QRS complex are very, very tiny, it could be opaque, or it could be some kind of fluid or some pus or something inside the thorax, that's the reason my patient could be just made. Okay, this, this is how you have to correlate before you uh, just write down a single line statement. Your ECG report should include all these five very important points. Okay, ah, that was a pretty intense thing, right? Let's take a break. So this is, this is my daughter's cat. Yeah, she's always close to my laptop when I'm working. Now, let's quickly run through some of the cases. And um, I am going to start with the cases which that time I didn't have any kind of, I haven't done any training on electrocard, 
echocardiography. I didn't have my ultrasound machine, but I was still practicing cardiology, still trying to identify the cardiac patients. Okay, so this was, Minty was a very old Pekingese, uh, 10 year old girl. She came to me with a really bad teeth, but she came to me Disney like this. Okay, I'm turning on, uh, Dr. Vishal, I would like for you to tell me if you can hear the audio. It's a small video. Huh? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Was it audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll play it again. So what kind of breathing was that? So you see the extended neck, wide stance, look at the eyes, all you know, dilated pupils. It's trying to keep its mouth open with the extended neck. It's trying to breathe in as much as it possibly can, but it has short breaths, right? It has short breaths. So, so you know, it's a severely dysnic patient. That's how it came to me. Now, we quickly took an ECG. Um, they said that you know it has had cough, especially the nocturnal cough for about three months, but they treated for all kinds of uh, respiratory thing. They did a lot of nebulization and all, but suddenly for last, uh, um, you know, it fell just unconscious last night and they just came to me. In the early morning, there's like, ma'am, this is how it was. It's just, it, for a few seconds, it was not responding this and that, okay? Now, if you look at the ECG down there in that strip, you have a. If, can you can you see my cursor there, Dr. Vishal? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now I'm putting the cursor onto the P wave now. That's a P wave. That's a PR segment, and this deep down there is a Q wave. Ideally, the Q wave should not be more than two small square deep. That is a normal Q wave. But here you see it is more than seven small squares. So these deep Q waves are called as pathological Q waves, which is a very, very classic thing about the hypoxia or hypoxemia. Okay, myocardial hypoxia. It means there's a very, very less oxygen to the heart muscle cells. And then you have a QRS complex, Sorry, an, an R, R wave and this is the S wave. Sorry, a small S wave and this is the T wave. And see, the dog was not only uh, tachypneic, but also slightly tachycardic. Now, after being in our clinic for a couple of hours, this is how it went back. Does it look good? Yes. Now, what did we do here? There was nothing miracle we did. We know that there's no oxygen. It's getting breathless. Just put it on the oxygen. We didn't do much, honestly. We didn't do much. Yes, we did give a furosemide shot, suspecting it to be the mitral lull disease, looking at the age of the dog and the kind of breed predilection that can go through. We did give a LASIK shot, but we put it on. At that time, we didn't even have our extra machine. You know? So um, I just put it on oxygen about little high flow, two to three liters, and we left it. We left it like that for a um, high flow for about an hour's time, then cut down the flow a little bit. And so they start responding so well. And after that, at that time, we referred it for echocardiography elsewhere, and then the triple therapy treatment was started on. Okay, so you really do not need uh, huge equipments. ECG itself can help you identify as well as save the life right there. Okay, just an ECG. Now, this was a lockdown found. So we used to do a lot of rescues and, uh, you know, we used to feed a lot of dogs during the lockdown period. So here we found this little pup onto the road, on the road, and it was hypothermic and what lot with some, you know, there were a lot of volunteers who were helping us feed the dogs during those times. So she's like, ma'am, let's quickly run to the clinic. She came down to me and she's like, ma'am, it's not responding and all. So we could not uh, put an IV anywhere. You see almost all the four legs were gone. So we put it uh, right in the juggler, the IV and tried. So it was absolutely cold. I could not auscultate anything. I could not hear. I don't even know if the dog is breathing. You know, It was that bad. So it's connected to the oxygen. Everything was there. So then I put an ECG lead so. Oh, I can see the waves. Okay, I can see the waves, no problem. Put it on oxygen, leave it and keep warm. 
See, it has helped me by time. All these ECGs are in in succession of period of time, like you know, five minutes, ten minutes durations. Maybe we kept we kept oxygenating the bed, we kept it warm, and you see the uh, how we started with a very very tiny R uh, R wave, and then we slowly increase the amplitude of R wave. At least we know that the pup didn't die. We didn't you know we didn't have to dispose the pup saying that it has died. It was absolutely numb. There was no responses, no mentation, nothing. But it took us about seven to eight hours, uh, you know, to see some reflexes in this kid. It was an amazing recovery. God bless. Anyways. Next. Um, so all these cases where we didn't start yet the ultrasounds yet. Anyways, Dobby is a, another very old patient. And so Dobby was my regular um, regular patient almost for seven, eight, nine years. And suddenly I get a call saying that uh, he had episodes of unconsciousness suddenly falling down for three or four times or maybe five times in just two days. And we know that Dobby is hypothyroidic. He was slightly obese, but being a brachycephalic, the first thing that comes to your mind is, okay, let's immediately do an ECG and see. Fortunately or unfortunately, when he was on my table, he went through a long episode, he went through, a, sorry, not a short episode of syncope again while we were recording our ECG. So we have a very valuable ECG here. You see that first top strip where you don't see anything anyway from and then slowly it just comes up. Okay. That was an entire period of sinus arrest. Complete sinus. So this, if you have three or more than three seconds, no blood supply to the brain, that is when you feel syncope. You feel this unconscious and suddenly the patient falls down. But after the episode of syncope, it is all absolutely normal as if nothing has happened to it. Okay. Now, what is the choice of treatment for such patients? Pacemaker installation is the only thing that you can do. Severe bradycardia, sinus arrest, brachycephalic dog. That's the only thing that you can do. However, at that point of time, definitely not possible and they were not willing to take the dog to anywhere. I, I don't think till then they have reported even the pacemaker installation in India. So what we did, I coordinated with my cardiology mentor, human mentor, and then he was like, why don't you try isoprenaline? I did try isoprenaline. Initially, we started with injectable one because we didn't have oral one. And then it was put on the long duration for oral one. And, and I, you know, Darby made it for about two and a half, three years. And then, you know, he had his natural death. So this is more like a sick sinus syndrome. The sinoatrial node is not generating, it's not firing, okay? Now, um, my lucky mascot, um, he's Bobo, a 13 year old, uh, uh, sorry, not two years, he's a 13 year old, that's a typo, sorry for that. He's a very old uh, Maltese, uh, just about one and a half, two kgs. And so this guy comes to me, um, with a with a complaint of uh, a chronic cough, and uh, this guy didn't want to lie down and sleep for a long duration. Okay, and um, she, so the lady who got me this dog, she herself was a masseur and a natural therapist, a lot of homeopathy believer. So he was already on a lot of medications, which were definitely not allopathic medicines, not veterinary specific. So. He had a fainting episodes so or someone referred Kitty Kek Bari the Kakile Kao. So they came and I took a chest X-ray. Can you see? Where are the lungs? No lungs. Okay. He had a huge, huge, huge heart. It's a very tiny dog, huh? just two kg dog and a huge heart. Look at the ECG here. So here that is a P wave, then you have a tall QRS complex, and you have a T wave here. So the the, the the height of the QRS complex is um, one, two, three, for almost five, uh, almost five big squares. Okay, so the size of the heart is so big that it's taking long uh, voltage to depolarize and repolarize. A huge voltage to depolarize and repolarize. Okay, so that itself tells that okay, fine, it definitely could be, um, you know. Usually, because there's a toy breed, so it's uh, already into myxomatous mitral valve degeneration, or it's already into congestive heart failure, or the other words is like it has a, it just has a big heart that needs to be understood. Now, Milo, another very beautiful, very 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 gentle. 
miniature pomeranian uh, she has been my patient already for you know a uh, couple of years then i a uh, congestive heart failure patient i have already had the nocturnal calf so we were treating her for exercise intolerance though it's a miniature pom can you see how bulky she is so she is a severely hypothyroidic girl too so yeah she was we put her on uh, uh, triple therapy she was good um, almost little more than a year and then she comes down to me she comes down very dysnic i mean signs of dysnia see expiratory dysnia kind of thing. it's hard to say if it is expiratory or inspiratory but the patient is like that see the abdominal movements okay now just in a month's time she deteriorated so badly look at her now long pause Oof. long pause okay it's a very very bad stage in just a month's time already a heart patient already on the medication and then she comes down like this okay fine so these are echocardiography images just to, i have put here for a comparative analysis like from may 20 to may 22 in one year's time you know a 9 year old dog obese hypothyroidic with a mitral valve degeneration there was not lot of progress in the heart disease heart still looked the way it was okay but why is my patient going clinically bad now look at at the ecg ecg looks great actually actually it just looks like a normal ecg right you have a beautiful p wave you have small tiny q which is normal and you can't expect more than two small uh, two big squares for a qrs complex in, in a in a tiny dog it's fine okay we have a small t wave negative t wave here it's okay and spacing fine it looks like respiratory sinus arrhythmia wherein you see wider spaces during expiration and closely spaced out wave forms during inspiration i did not i really don't see any difference in here like anything abnormal here not the difference anything abnormal here okay so if my ecg is normal if the ecg looks good if my echocardiography hasn't worsened why is my patient getting clinically bad so this is your answer in april 2022 when we took an x ray i just saw it as a regular you know see a patient when it came down in may do you see this here do you see the compression of carina here you see how trachea has become so that expiratory dysnea or the dysnic situation was because there was a huge lung tumor which was compressing the carina so the trachea was getting compressed because of that growth over there okay and uh, after that we did quite few things you know we put her on ct confirmed it to the ct and uh, so pet parent uh, were kind of okay putting her down because of her suffering she was suffering 24/7 so we had to take a call on that okay so here though it's a congestive heart failure patient though in the advanced stage of the disease still the ecg looked normal so ecg was not a very big use here <coughs> so this case was referred to me uh, they were old clients really good friends of dr hartikar sir from mumbai so they moved out to hyderabad so he referred it to me so the case came down to me in an emergency had zero mentation the dog was absolutely recumbent it was hard to know if it was breathing because there was hardly an abdominal movements either so i literally had to put some cotton right in front of its nostril to understand the movement okay so uh, the physical examination revealed the 100 degrees is temperature and uh, palomitos membranes the crt was really really high and um, no mentation it was like almost comatose general anesthetized dog and uh, the, the palpebral reflexes was hardly anything i'll show you how it looked like see the mucous membranes all cyanotic that's why i'm doing a crt there right so what should be the differentials of a patient when he comes like that first thing is check if it's in the renal failure or not check if he's hypothermic or not or check if he's uh, going through um, some kind of uh, 
sinus terrace or not i mean you know he is he is almost like nothing right so after 6 hours this is how he was so there's a beautiful story about this so there were a tamilian brahmin family and after i fed them i'm feeding them actually i was so excited so my junior was recording i'm mean like okay maine nazar bhi utar diya uska anyways so yeah i was so excited seeing his uh, thing you know and uh, so she asked me very gently ma'am what did you feed him my dog hasn't eaten in four days what did you feed him i said i fed him chicken stock homemade chicken oh my god i am a brahmin my dog is a brahmin ma'am he never had chicken i said if he doesn't have chicken he will die yeah to feed chicken <laughs> anyways so this is what happened now what happened to him just the ecg gave me the most crucial information because when it comes down in our it's a regular practice because mine is a mostly a referral clinic so the first thing the patient comes down immediately what we do is we see if he's recumbent we put it on oxygen we uh, try to record the temperature body temperature do a blood glucose and put an ecg ye hum logon ka standard protocol hai as soon as the patient comes from the recumbent stage we look at this what is what is different in here dr vishal what do you see which wave is uh, different here hyperkalemia so, p wave yeah absolutely so this is your p wave this yeah, is your q wave this is your r wave this is yeah. your s this is an st segment and there's a tall and wide t wave okay yes. as if someone has pulled the t wave up you know you hold it and you pull up it's like that this is a very very classic appearance ideally the uh, the height of the t wave recommended is approximately or less than 25% of the r wave is what is standard recommendation which is normal but if you see here this is equal to r wave 100% almost like 80 85% so this tall and wide t wave are suggestive of hyperkalemia and looking at the patient condition and the age you can suspect that i am just putting you an echo here because we did the echo on this guy um not to confuse you because echo hasn't helped us understand uh, uh, or diagnose uh, the emergency stage of the patient see he is through a very bad mitral valve degeneration i know very bad here but do you really think that has happened in a minute or two or in days no it has been there for many years now the so 16 year old guy what do you expect but this thing if i am not seeing any pleural effusions any pericardial effusions i don't think there's any uh, thing to do with that kind of heart for that emergency so t waves just doing an ecg has given us this and then immediately we took the blood and estimated so it is 6.6 okay now what's the thing potassium has come out of the cell you have to put the potassium back into the cell there are many ways of doing it a lot of beautiful papers available you can study but what we have used it we used 50% uh, glucose t25 we pushed it back we kept track of the blood glucose and we also had insulin ready just in case um, if he gets into hyperglycemia okay and it took about 6 hours of oxygenation and uh, um, cri management uh, using uh, glucose and we recovered the patient okay this is a very very old case where at that time you know i i didn't even have an ecg machine so but the cat comes to me like that okay and what pet parent was saying was it always tries to find the wall and walk across see look at the gait in coordination look at uh, the head down position that it has okay so this pet parents were also you know like madam kya hua hai nervous problem hai x ray karwa ke aana hai ye karna hai wo karna hai i said okay i have this i want to do a blood work on this and uh, kitna cost hoga i said itna hoga and they were like oh ma'am fir to rehne dijiye koi goli likh dijiye i said no no whatever i'm saying if it turns out to be right then you pay if it doesn't then i'll pay and it turned out to be hypokalemic so but it's a cat now what do we do I can't put it it's not an emergency that i need to put it in iv so in humans you have uh, k bound you have potassium binders at that time uh, we didn't have uh, all these uh, beautiful products which are available now so i used the k bound powder from humans and uh, we we asked them to get uh, you know sterile bottles got some we used the sterile bottles and added 
distilled water to it, reconstituted, calculated, and is like, okay, fine. Go ahead and give these many drops, come back after four days. So it really helped this cat. And then it was, we were recommended them to keep ch checking the renal values and for lifetime to put it on the renal diet. Because we know these portions are extremely prone to uh, renal failures because of the block cat situations and all that. But yes. And it was a six year old male. So. Now this slide, again, it's just from internet, just for you help, to help you understand, look at the changes in the T wave. So beyond nine, it's, it's a flat line. And these changes I think have been uh, uh, put here based on the human studies, okay? Now, many small dogs we have seen. Let's see what happens in these big dogs. If you look at the strip, the rhythm strip. So this guy comes to me, simple, was like not much. The clinical presentation was, ma'am, only my uh, dog's uh, abdomen, you know, the belly looks a little, slightly bigger. He's been there for a couple of months now. Slowly he is getting breathless while he's sleeping also. Okay, fine. So it was recommended to some hospital and they came down and they did, uh, they uh, referred to us for cardiac evaluation. And the moment we take an ECG, look at that. Look at the dog, he's very comfortable, right? Comparatively, he doesn't look desnic, he doesn't look recumbent, he's not an emergency patient. But if you look at an ECG, can anyone tell me what kind of arrhythmic ear is here? It's written down there, it's an atrial fibrillation. Where is the P wave? Do I see a P wave? There's no P wave. Yeah, there's no, no P wave. No. And the gap, the spacing between the two RR complexes is all good? varied. Absolutely. Yes. It's an irregularly irregular or it's an irregular rhythm. So it's called as an atrial fibrillation. An atrial fibrillation itself is an emergency, to be honest. And when does it happen? When your atria are significantly enlarged and they just contract like that. They contract like that. Okay. It's an atrial fibrillation. And uh, so now you know what kind of patient you have. Severely enlarged atria, I know that thing. And it's a, it's a big dog, it's a Labrador, six and a half year old male. So I am interested in doing an echo. I did an echo, but um, see, in, in about down, five down. or six months time. Down. So that's the mom sending me a video with a beautiful thank you note. But yeah. Okay, sit. Down. 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 Okay, there's a lot of down there. So yeah, so he, he significantly improved. images here right now because I think we'll put it for some other time but yeah by just looking at an ECG you know that you have a patient who need to be aggressively monitored. Now this kid here was just a one year old uh, German Shepherd absolutely not interested in life. Okay, he came down to me was so depressed and it actually a rescue guy was rescued when he was just three or four months old. The person who has rescued wonderful family so they were like, ma'am, I'm trying to feed him so much. He's always bony. His pota is always like his, his tummy is always very big. And you can literally see all the blood vessels over the tummy. That is what his explanation was. It was a referral case, again, coming from a very young, wonderful vet, Dr. Sajita. So she has been sending me some incredibly great cases. Uh, just this week itself, uh, I had just two days back, actually. I had a wonderful uh, case. Um, where it was a non-cardiac presentation, but absolutely looked, looked like a cardiac patient. We diagnosed there was a tumor in the uh, larynx. Anyways, so look at this kid, how he looks like. Hugely distended abdomen and looking at the, you know, um, the uh, tympani itself, you can say that there could be a lot of fluid in there. Okay, he's all bony. When you look at the chest X-ray, the entire chest was just filled with the heart. There was so much of um, opacities in the cardinal lung lobes, which is a great suggestion of uh, suggestive of uh, you know uh, something with cardiac origin. And just a one-year-old German Shepherd, one-year-old German Shepherd. 
Anyways, so down there you have an ECG strip where I have uh, taken the strip both at 25 and 50 speed, 25 and 50 speed. And then I had to literally cut down the voltage. See, the, the bottom one was when we came. So the standard protocol is we take the ECG strips at 10 millivolts. Okay. But because it was just going way beyond my uh, strip, so I had to cut it down to 5 millivolts. And then we took the ECG to understand and read the rhythm. Do you see the PAs here again? There are no P waves. And the, and the gap, the distance between the two RR complexes is also varied. It's all different. So it's again in a regular rhythm. So this is again an atrial fibrillation. Okay. So it's atrial fibrillation at one year age. You know, you have an emergency patient. You know, it has to be aggressively treated. And you know, you have what kind of counseling you have to do to the pet parent. Okay. So there's so much of information just by looking at an ECG strip. So I have some, you know, hundreds of beautiful ECGs, um, many, many of them, to be honest. I just put a couple of arrhythmias here. Um, you know, if, if we are handling arrhythmias eventually, then we can talk about each one of this. Case-wise also, we can talk about it. There's so much information that you can get just looking at a simple strip. Hardly, you know, one ECG strip, if you take, you know, it will not even cost you about 10 rupees or 15 rupees, maybe. And um, yeah, but the, the cost of an ECG strip, what you do, it's your knowledge, your acumen of reading it and trying to clinically correlate it with the patient or to project it. Okay. The wonderful modality, guys. So a nutshell, overall, so this nutshell information also, it also uh, talks about what kind of myths we have burst here. I would say... ECG is the only way to know whether your patient is going through any kind of arrhythmias. Okay, there is no other way to know about the arrhythmias, whether it's in your OT or whether your patient is recumbent or not, whether it's just walking, whether it's a geriatric patient, all happy and good. See, for example, if a boxer comes to you even at the age of one year, you know what you should do? You should ask, counsel the pet parent that we should do an ECG. Are, why ECG? The heart looks good. It does look good, but you know, there is every possibility that it might go through a disease called ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So I would definitely want to do a preventive ECG. Believe me, guys, I am my entire clinic runs only on the referral basis. And I'm telling you, if you learn how to counsel pet parents technically, help them understand what you want, help them uh, talk in a sense where you are trying to prevent emergencies, prevent suffering, they definitely understand. And it's hardly ECG costs anything, right? So tell them, take an ECG. Okay, that's your ground zero ECG. That's the first ECG. Then ask them to, um, you know, run the pair, pet for like about seven, eight minutes. Ask them to run in, in your in your lawn down there. Okay, and then dog comes panting. That time, take an ECG again. So if there are any slightest changes in your ECG. If you see even a one single VPC, you know you have a patient in hand. That is how you do it. Okay. Now, looking at the ECG strip itself, you can say whether the patient is in the rhythm or not. See, let me tell you something. There's a word called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Remember, I showed you an ECG where in the inspiration, when you breathe in, the number of beats is more. When you breathe out, the beats are spaced out. It's absolutely normal in our animals, in our patients. Respiratory sinus arrhythmia need not be treated. It's just a normal scenario, okay? But if you see if a patient is getting into, you know, tachycardia or bradycardia, very high number of uh, beats, very low number of beats, ECG is the only way to detect it. Okay. Another thing is whether we just saw how, whether it is coming from a sinus, a sinoatrial node or not, whether the rhythm is generated from any, anywhere else or not, whether the rhythm which is generated with the impulse which is generated to the SA node, whether it is coming down to the ventricles, has it been conducted or not, talks to you about, uh, talks about the AV blocks. Okay. And the certain congenital heart defects, for example, uh, you have uh, left bundle branch block or you have uh, certain patients uh, uh, with tricuspid dysplasia or ASDs, they do show partial right bundle branch blocks. So these are many things that you can say. But you can also talk about if there is any, um, uh, if there is any, what do you call, uh, uh, um, low voltage QRSS, I told you, you have to instantly, you know, 
think about okay is there some hindrance to my ecg uh, is, is is the is the conduction is hindered either because of obesity or because of some pleural effusions or pericardial effusions or hydrothorax or calothorax or whatever it is and just looking at an ecg strip we identified okay it's hyperkalemic or not similarly you there are ecg changes for calcium abnormalities for magnesium abnormalities okay you can just looking at an ecg you can talk about it you can also identify um, pericarditis looking at an ecg it's very much possible okay just looking at the pr intervals you have an ele elevated pr interval when you see uh, uh, when, when a patient is in pericarditis okay so um you know there's so much uh, so much with an ecg that um just looking at simple strip you can you can identify a cardiac patient but not all the cardiac patients second important thing is you can say that um because certain ecgs are absolutely normal like you know we just told you about the milo the lung tumor girl absolutely normal ecg yeah she was she was showing severe mr she was already on the treatment but always her ecg was fantastically normal right so that is also a possibility there are these are the limitations that though we are able to identify many many uh, cardiac compromises many changes both systemic and cardiac in the ecg but the limitations are it cannot you cannot stage the patient even if i identify it you cannot stage the patient for staging you need advanced modalities okay and you cannot say if a certain parts of the heart are affected for example endocardium or you know pericardium or if there are variations in the valves how does the structure of the valve look like whether there is a flail valve or not if there is a breakage in the valve or if the valve is actually formed or not formed these things you got many of the congenital heart defects you cannot the effect because so all the congenital heart defects that can tell you but so it could be just a differential okay and sometimes uh, you know we say that it's just a static picture right it is not a dynamic modality so it is a static picture it's not going to tell about the it's not going to tell about it will it will it doesn't tell you the variations of the contractility whether you have a good contractility or a low contractility it doesn't tell you if the shape of the heart is changing it might give a mild indication of the size of the heart but you know it doesn't give you the uh, if, if there is a rounding of the apex or not it doesn't give you that okay sometimes it could be a very confusing thing also for example like you know um, my, we saw that patient who had the chicken stock fine hyperkalemic patient but look like a cardiac possible cardiac patients even a severe diabetic patient also looks like that so patient with a severe renal failure would also look like that even the ecg changes will also be like that so if you treat the root cause you know the heart abnormalities can go off at least pacify uh, to certain extent it's like that so we do have certain limitations of ecg but in comparison to the advantages in comparison to the concept that you can identify your patient right away and then take a call whether i need to if if i feel that okay fine i do see changes you saw that black dog no sit down stay sit down stay guy atrial fibrillation so the dog was running around everything was pretty normal it's only just you started seeing little bit of uh, um, abdominal distension fine i really want to send my patient to echocardiography or do more advanced like okay let's do a chest x ray let's do an echocardiography to identify at what stage my patient is because the ecg looks terrible but the patient looks kind of okay do i need to take a call on starting antiarrhythmic drugs when do i start the pemovendin when do i put them on diuretics does it need any supplementation is my ecg just these little changes in the ecg helping me or are hinting me that at least if i can postpone my echocardiography because my pet parents doesn't want to afford it right now no problem let me counsel them for at least start them on supplements there are a lot of taurine supplements you know whatever uh, um, we have been using taurine like so crazily because fantastically palatable product okay it really helps definitely it helps because they have never had these things before and putting these things on in the diet always helps this is the time when i'm supposed to counsel my pet parents to limit their um uh, carbohydrates not more than 20% of carb put them in high protein diet if the kidneys are pretty normal see there's so much there's so much that you can talk about by just looking at an ecg strip okay 
So I would like for you all to please go ahead and click a picture of this because we would definitely talk be talking about uh, these things in our next webinar. So go ahead, read about the electrical impulse. How is it generated? How is it propagated in the myocardial cells? Also, at least try to quickly glance through uh, the cardiac arrhythmias. I will help uh, post certain material in the groups through Dr. Vishal. I'll share you certain material. You know, it will be just a startup one or maybe a very beautiful book I'll share. So that it helps in them understand uh, through the next webinars. Because, say, in 30 minutes or one hour, you can't go through a lot of things, right? So yes, let's do that. And then um, I have a lot of uh, cases to share. I shall definitely try to do the justice. Uh, showing um, the most classy ones at least okay and then you'll be like oh this kind of patient this type of patient i have seen i didn't know it was this it definitely hota hai. i have always heard this thing people talk about and then also try to quickly glance through uh, different antiarrhythmic drugs because the treatment part is all we are all very much interested and targeted at antiarrhythmic drugs at least their classifications or at least know their names so that when we are running through the webinars, it doesn't get, uh, it's at least sounds that it is not new to you, okay? So please try to do that for your next webinars. So we all know who this person is, right? So whoever, a veterinarian not possessing this book, it's a crime. It should always have an address. Yes, yes, of course. Wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, you know, whatever the huge bulky ones, but it's great. Okay, there are certain beautiful chapters written on cardiology to in this. So my big thank you goes to all these people who has been referring because the cases which I'm going showing you now or in future, these are all being referred by these wonderful people. So these are all the primary referring with. Some of them are my mentors, some are my juniors. Most of them are my juniors and a couple of my seniors too. So if they are able to identify a cardiac patient, you can too, okay? So for a veterinary cardiologist or a veterinary cardio enthusiast, these are the three books I would always, always recommend you to please have them on. First two are wonderful books you can start with. I will try to post uh, the soft copies of this once we are done, okay? And the third one, you should definitely have a hard copy though I have a soft copy of it, but once you get into little advanced cardiology, you can have it. And on the right, you have lots of beautiful websites which uh, you can walk through. And a big thank you to the, my vet guardians because they always keep me on toes. Uh, teaching them or sharing the knowledge with them has been one of the most crucial things which has helped me study more. It's been a wonderful, wonderful journey uh, since about five and a half, six years now. So a big thank you to them. So wonderful people in my life. Most of them are my mentors, my cardio mentors, my veterinary mentors. So the guy on the top, uh, the, the second picture out there is Dr. Philip Fox whose textbook I was referring you, and that down there you have Dr. Tille, and here in the bottom left corner is Dr. Masami Yuichi. This person is the only one who is doing a surgical mitral repair in the entire world. He's from Japan, and the picture on the, uh, next to the Dr. Tille, this is the one which me and uh, Dr. Naik Bajarnik, he is my, um, um, my cardio mentor from uh, Sydney University, and then I have Dr. Madhusudan, sir, uh, you know, there are people, you know, Dr. Meshkar Karesar, you know, Dr. Padam Jain, Dr. Sangeeta Ma. See, these are the people who inspire you. Okay, on the top right corner are my clinic staff, and the bottom is my family. So thank you, a big thank you to all of them, because if it wasn't for them, probably I wouldn't have been here. So am I audible, Dr. Vishal? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Okay. So we recently started Veterinary Cardiovascular Society. Okay, to hone up a knowledge and also to take up exclusive cardiology um, educational sessions. Um, you know, we have lots of plans of starting uh, um, eventual certification courses and whatnot. There, there are many things onto it. So it's open to join. You're very welcome to join us. Um, and let's uh, take up uh, the study of uh, veterinary cardiology a step ahead. Okay. That's it. I am done and I'm open to the questions. If someone would like to ask me something. I have a chat box here. If you can access map, this chat box uh, is having the questions people have already posted. Uh, I have the chat box, but I don't see any questions. Uh, one is, uh, can we use slight or minor anesthesia for dogs who have who are not calm and quiet during ECG? 
See, I wouldn't say anesthesia because that is definitely going to change the rate of the heart. It's going to change the contractility. That is what we do. We put them in anesthesia so that all these things calm down when you do your surgery, right? So that you can reduce down the intensity of bleeding. On the other hand, you can use bitorphinol, a very low dosage. You know, maybe if, if it is... Um, if it is extremely uh, aggressive patient, you want to do it, but because if you have a cardiac compromised patient, they are not aggressive. But if you feel a severe tachypnea, I put them on oxygen. I take a standing ECG if possible, create a calm environment, allow them to be in that room for 15, 20 minutes. If those things don't worry, then about 0.1 or 0.2 mg per kg body weight of bitorphanol and intramuscular injection. 10, 15 minutes will give you good. It doesn't make a lot of changes in the ECG. Bitorphanol is kind of pretty good. Never give any kind of anesthetics. And definitely not that. Uh, Dr. Bharat is asking, how to identify ST covering? What is its significance? ST coving, C-O-V-I-N-G? ST coving. Uh, I think, yes, I'm really sorry. My pronunciation was bad. Coving. See, when you see a, a curve like that, an ST segment going down like that, then it's called as an ST coving. So ST segment, it curves like that, and then it just merges with the T wave. Um, ST coving are very, very easy to identify on an ECG strip until and unless you have a lot of breathing artifacts. And what is the significance of ST? See, in my opinion, you do see ST uh, um, depression or coving or elevation only in the patients who are compromised on their oxygen content. If they're hypoxemic, hypoxic. So you already know the patient is compromised. Put it on oxygen and see the changes. Makes a big difference. But does it really have an impact on the functioning? Uh, unlike in humans, you know, ST segment uh, uh, changes are very, very critical. And uh, in coronary artery diseases, that's the, they call as the STEMIs, S-T-E-M-I. ST segment elevation, which causes the myocardial infarcts. Um, I mean, slight changes are also very important, but because we do not have coronary artery diseases, so I am not very keen about ST segments um, because those intense changes which you see in the ST segments are mostly uh, severely uh, compromised patients, and uh, you are more into uh, putting them on oxygen, you know, putting a uh, whatever, you know, uh, in the chamber, oxygen chamber, or giving an ambient environment, or checking in a quick chest X-ray and putting them on a LASIK, so things like that. So, yeah, that's how you do it. Uh, what what was the name of the drug given to Dobby? Isoprenilin. Isoprenilin. Any dose? The standard is about 0.5 mg per kg body weight, BID, but we just put him on SI. Okay. But we did recommend them to always have a, uh, you know, concentrator, a five-liter concentrator at home and ask them to put it on a oxygen concentrator for some time, at least a few months. So I'm not sure if they've done it, but that you can recommend. That is for atrial fibrillation. Oh, no, no. That was for the long sinus arrest, the pug which was falling off. There was no way, no, it was a straight line. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, and how um, do we calculate? Yes. How do we calculate P duration and QRS duration if there is any uh, baseline undulations are there? Try to select the best possible wave and then compare that wave. You see if there is a repeatability. What I normally do is I take long strips. After a certain time, my patient stabilizes or I give them some time, or I put them on butorphanol, or I put them on oxygen. It is very much possible. Annually, severely tachypneic, uh, we got some uh, baseline undulations. In such cases, what we do is, ma'am? standing ECG. The undulations are much lesser in a standing ECG. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. It was a nice session, madam. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Aurelia, for, for conducting such a great... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you very much. Uh, drug given for uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. Drug given for? Atrial fibrillation. We are going to read about it. Jaldi kya hai. Bahut sara time baki hai. 
all the all the medication parts are coming up so wait wait and treatment parts definitely we're going to handle i hope dr vishal will be handling in future right definitely in detail don't worry about the treatment try to understand how the waveform is formed what is the shape of the waveform what is the uh, uh, relationship of that waveform with the clinical uh, correlation with the patient that is important this is a very introductory session guys so don't jump into the and i am definitely not going to spoon feed any of the treatments i'll just tell you rhythm kya hai rhythm kaise pehchanna you are going to tell me the treatment that is the reason i have given a homework hai na ji there is a doctor yeah there is a doctor from pakistan hmm Dr. Sir, Dr. Uh, Asadullah Korizo from is a final year student from Pakistan. He has uh, sent his greetings to you and said thank you to you. And treatment protocol again, people are asking. Telegram group name is Buy a Vet for the Vets. If uh, somebody is interested in the books, so a lot of books PDF format they are available on the Buy a Vet for the Vets. And one more Telegram group we are helping our community. young students young veterinarians if they are they want to have a job in some clinic and some private clinics who are having some vacancies we put on vets jobs that is also a telegram group we are having a community of more than 1800 students and uh, uh, veterinary veterinarians who are having clinics so you can directly send your queries regarding that if you need a veterinarian or if you need a job we post the cvs there you get directly direct queries from the veterinarians and if you need any veterinarian uh, for uh, as an assistant veterinarian you can put your vacancy you can send your vacancy to me and we can put it there so that way also we are helping um, clinics and veterinary small animal practices therapeutic management of again same question uh, ma'am can you please talk little bit about vpcs vpcs yeah. I'm going to handle arrhythmias, dear. VPCs, they are. Uh, it's. Um, and I'll show you many different cases in future. But whenever uh, the, the significance of VPCs is, how many VPCs do you see in a minute? So you are going to extrapolate it for the number of VPCs in 24 hours, which you usually are supposed to identify using a halter monitor. So you don't have uh, big uh, things of uh, veterinary specific halter monitors. They're very expensive. We don't have in our clinics. No problem. Fine. I took a strip of one minute. Okay. How many VPCs do I have? Are the VPCs spaced here and there, or they are in clusters? So the number of VPCs in a minute extrapolated to an hour and extrapolated to 24 hours. Now, if you have more than 5,000 VPCs in 24 hours, you have to put it on the drug. Most commonest is the sotalol, which you use oral sotalol. It gives you fantastic results. I shall uh, I shall share you a very beautiful uh, ECG um, of just last week. So of a cat, and I have never seen uh, cat VPCs, and they're really big and tall VPCs. I'll share you that case uh, in a couple of uh, maybe in 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 a future sessions. But yes, about the the concept of VPCs is if there are more than five thousand, you treat it whether the patient is clinically compromised or not compromised. primates and dog ecg same <clears throat> very good question um when it comes to the uh, shape of the ecgs the uh, the waveform p q r s t sub put same absolutely same the only biggest difference is about uh, your t waves so any changes in the t waves any changes in the st segments are of huge significance in uh, primates or in human ecgs uh, because of the coronary artery diseases because they cause huge myocardial infarcts so that is the biggest difference when you see um apart from that um ecgs uh, showing you know in humans uh, pericarditis is very common okay a patient when is sitting they feel very comfortable when they are lying down they have an intense chest pain that is a very classic appearance of pericarditis just doing an ecg you can identify that kind of pericarditis so except for these changes the shape of the ecg the you know the waveform is absolutely same no difference ma'am would it be possible to interpret an ecg in animals that have already been sedated why not heart is still functioning right you have to um 
when you, when you are talking about interpreting an ecg say what drug are you using to sedate the animal so you are talking about the influence of that drug on the heart rate that drug on the rhythm that drug on the shape of the waveform why not take an ecg before sedating and take an ecg after sedating you'll see a big difference definitely you can uh does shape of bifid p wave give any indication about left or right atrial enlargement there are a few things I understood the question. So there are a few uh, things which have we have shipped, um, uh, uh, skipped in this because I wanted to handle it in detail in, in coming sessions. So when you look at the P wave like that, just a small, just two small squares and two small squares like that, it's normal. If you have a P wave which goes like this, about four or five uh, small squares tall and four or four small squares wide. what does it tell you it takes long duration to from the right atrium to the left atrium depolarization it means that it taking a, a big dis distance right on the other hand i mean it taking a longer voltage on the other hand if it goes like that if it comes like that like an m shape okay p mitral p mitral are very common in the left atrial enlargements you can see that Yes, just looking at the bifid P wave, you know that you have a cardiac compromise, badly compromised patient. Standing and uh, recumbent ECG, which one is good? Always recumbent. Always recumbent. Until and unless my patient is severely dyspneic, not allowing me to put onto the table, I take a standing ECG. Nahi, it always. In my clinic, there's a rule: we always do. uh a standing and uh, recumbent uh, 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 lateral recumbency ecg uh, for pugs only pugs baki sab everyone is sleeping no standing ecg is at all for the first case shown to us the 10 year old pegnis how was the ecg taken was the dog placed in lateral recumbency oh no 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 it was sitting in the sternal recumbency when we took the ecg okay what is the significant significance of reverse qrs complex you see very good question thanks for asking that uh, inverted qrs complexes mostly are suggestive of bundle branch blocks especially the right bundle branch block you see an inverted qrs complex sometimes you see that uh, even in tricuspid dysplasia with uh, the right bundle branch or the partial bundle branch blocks fascicular blocks the multiple things where you see that um now even if you have an inverted qrs uh, um, okay let me give you my example i have a partial right bundle branch block and my my ecgs are always inverted oh i'm normal right i'm not yes. clinically compromised at all and i didn't know about this thing until and unless i had to go through a surgery until and unless i went through a pre surgical evaluation so kuch nahi hota if my patient is compromised then i know right please recommend the food and feeding protocol during heart disease oh we'll talk about it we'll talk about it when we're talking uh, uh, treatment part yes nutraceuticals nutri health and ma sorry yes. i have a question so they are not they don't want to we are just we are just finishing up ma'am uh, any care to be taken while handling these patients i think we have already discussed that or you would like to throw some light on that which patient specifically i mean cardiac patients i think the dyspnea patient uh, i think pre oxygenation is good i believe the, oh, this is the best thing we can do on how uh, they come to you very important and don't rush in taking uh, putting them on recumbency please don't do that and if you want to take an ecg you know if you want to take a chest x ray also be very careful okay suddenly putting them on lateral recumbency can just allow them to collapse So if they are dyspnea, pre-oxygenate, pre-oxygenate. That's best. Uh, one is more than five thousand VPS, twenty-four hours per twenty-four hours. Then what are those the drug kindly given? Please repeat. I use Sotalol, but yeah, Orally. we'll talk about it. Orally. Uh, orally. Uh, cardiac tumor cases. What kind of ECG abnormalities we can see? Cardiac tumor. any specification i can see the case but it's on the publication um i can quickly give you a glance of that in the coming lectures um absolutely normal ecg 
and it has a chemodectoma, huge chemodectoma. Eventually, when the heart increase really big in size, I saw it as an atrial fibrillation. You can never identify a cardiac tumor or a lung tumor or any kind of tumor by looking at an ECG. No, you can't. Ma'am, what are the ECG particularities of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Again, when you say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you have an answer in the word. It's thickened myocardium. Thickened myocardia takes longer voltages to, uh, uh, you know, high voltages to pass through and depolarize. So you can see taller uh, waves. Uh, in natural recumency, which is... Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is because of hypothyroidism in that you see small QR, small complexes, but mostly they will show you tall complexes. Sorry, yes. In lateral recumency, which side is preferred? Right lateral? Right or all down? the time. Um, but honestly, if you go through the books and ask for the latest recommendation, it doesn't make a very big difference whether it's right or left. But always have uh, uh, two views. That's a standard thing. Um, my two views are um, uh, um, a VD, uh, sorry, my two views are a right lateral recumbency and a VD if needed. But if my patient is compromised, DV and a right lateral are my preferences. Multi para monitors for vets only. Which one is good? I don't know. You don't use that? I do. I, I bought But you don't, don't, don't recommend it. No, <laughs> don't recommend it. It's okay. I don't know. <laughs> I just bought a human one long ago, 10 years ago, and it's good enough. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we have challenged during surgery that due to heat pads, no stable ECG coming. Is it? Uh, I don't know what are these heat pads made of. If it has uh, a good insulation, I think you should be able to get. See, it's all about conduction, right? There should not be any metal. That's all. If you have a metal, get a good ECG. Uh, ventricular by Gemini, uh, tri Gemini. What is that? Uh, I really that. Yes, it will. Right, little. Achha, fine. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it was a long session. Your patients must be waiting for you. I know your clinic is working till 7 p.m. And uh, this was a wonderful session. I don't have any words to explain everything. Again, impressed as we are always from your sessions. And uh, literally, uh, I think now many vets will be benefited from this session and they can incorporate this knowledge in their day-to-day uh, -day practice. And uh, books we are sharing, a lot of things will be happening in coming sessions. We are, uh, You also request, ma'am, to give us time in future as soon as possible so that more and more sessions can be conducted. Thank you, ma'am, for so, giving such a... Benefit to the vets what you're doing, absolutely. It's, uh, you know... Um, I don't know, a company can get benefited in any ways, but your time, your patience, and keeping the sessions live, I, I always enjoyed it. And, um, and, and you know, see, it, it shows the popularity, the synchrony, the way you guys do it is, you know, 100 plus people, even after almost three hours, is a big deal. Yes, yes, deal. yes. Yeah, yes. You guys, and keep up uh, with the sharing of the knowledge, but I request all the participants here to please go through it again, because now this is available online, go through it again and jot it down, write it down, and try to go back and read for a few minutes. Then it is, it'll be permanently registered because basic sessions are very, very difficult to find anywhere. People don't teach basics because that is the most difficult thing to teach. So I would say learn the basics, advances. Any, any paper you pick up, you'll find a lot of information. You'll find so much of treatment protocols. You have so many variations of treatment protocols. And uh, even human papers, there's so much in advancement, but basics you can't find anywhere. So go ahead and read it and good luck with it. Thank you so much, Orihi Life Sciences, for inviting me. It has been a wonderful session and a great learning protocol, too. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Please take care.